continuing our study in the, the, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's role in our lives as believers. Um, this will be lesson two that we'll be studying on the Holy Spirit. And I'd like to, for us to, first of all, look at uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Let me know if you have those, Cindy. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, um, verse 21 and 22. Nah, that's fine. Take your time. Most of the passages this evening are almost all in the same couple books there. Yes, ma'am. So uh, we looked a little bit last week um, about the Holy Spirit being the down payment, the earnest, the guarantee, um, and, and dealt with how he's the seal on a, an envelope. And here it talks about God. It said he's given us the Holy Spirit as a seal, as a promise. And it shows us that we belong to him, and the ownership is there until we get to heaven. And then um, Ephesians 4.30, Cindy. So how long does it say that we're sealed for? Until the day of redemption. So that seal's not going to be broken. So the Holy Spirit is with us until the moment we die, until redemption comes. Um, so uh, John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them may be lost except the Son of God. Perdition. Perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And so Jesus, he's talking that, that, that those who God has given to him, God the Father has given to him to be saved, all of them will be saved. And the only one he says that he wasn't able to reach that was with him, and reference specifically to the disciples, is Judas, the son of perdition. He was the only one he could not reach. Then Ephesians 4.30. Again there. Ephesians 4.31 or 30? Go ahead and do 30 and 31, please. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are so for the day of redemption by all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking, but put, be put away from you with all malice. Malice. Mm -hmm. And so what we have here is in Ephesians 4.30 says, be careful not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And then it gives in verse 31 a list of sins that causes this grieving of the Holy Spirit. And so what causes us to grieve the Holy Spirit is just sin. When we sin, it hurts God. When we sin, it hurts God the Father, it hurts God the Son, and here we specifically told that it hurts God the Holy Spirit. Our sin hurts God. And so hopefully knowing that and realizing that, that would motivate us to try not to sin as much. Knowing that we're going to hurt God, because none of us want someone to hurt us, right? Right? So we, hopefully we don't want to try to hurt God either. Um, 2 Corinthians one twenty two. Who also has sealed us and given us a spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Again, where we looked at 1 Corinthians one twenty two, our a seal and guarantee. Now Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possessions to the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glory. And so the Holy Spirit is like the earnest or the down payment, the guarantee. Those of you who have bought a house, a lot of times if you want to plan on buying a house, you have to have a certain amount of money to put down. If you're going to get a car, a lot of times they want a certain amount of money put down. That's an earnest guarantee saying that you're willing to purchase this, and you also make a promise that you'll finish fulfilling making the payment on it. 
Um, and so the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. It is our earnest, a promise that one day we will go to heaven because we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. And then the next question we have down there, that, that, um, how does Christ giving us his Spirit as an earnest or an inheritance assures us of the ultimate redemption when we get to heaven? And again, it's that promise, it's that down payment, it's that guarantee that as you lay the money down, you're, you're telling someone, I am, I am going to keep my word, here's the money. And what happens if you don't keep your guarantee, a lot of times that earnest money you put down, that guaranteed money, you lose. A lot of times, a lot of, it's the same thing with like with those who rent. They have to put up a certain, what's called like a security deposit, and they lose that. But the Holy Spirit is with us until we get to heaven, because God is not going to renege on his duties. And so it's left up to God to, to fulfill what he promises he's going to do. And then we come to Exodus 40, 34 through 38 in the Old Testament. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up, for the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the houses of Israel throughout all their journeys. And so that's a long verse there, but what it's basically telling us about how God worked in the Old Testament, especially starting in the book of Exodus, and as she finds First Kings 8, 10 through 11, what we're going to see here is that in the Old Testament, and we got several more verses that are going to lead to that. The Old Testament, God came up on people. God rested upon people. God moved on top of people. But in the New Testament, God does what? He indwells. He lives. He stays. And we're going to see a little bit of difference as we look at some of these Old Testament verses. And we're going to compare it to Acts here in a second. But in 1 Kings 8.10 now, if you have that, Cindy. 8. First Kings eight ten through eleven. And it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not contain continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And so we have the temple of God that's being built now. And God shows that he approves, or he shows that he's with his people as he fulfill, fills up the temple um, with a, like a smoke and wind. And, and, and in the tabernacle, he followed the tabernacle wherever it moved with a, a pillar of fire and also with a, a cloud of smoke or a cloud in the sky. Uh, and then we come to Acts 2, 1 through 4, and then we'll go back to some Old Testament verses. But look at the New Testament, Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had finally come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them dividing tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. utterance. Mm -hmm. And so what we have here, we have a situation where we get into the book of Acts. Jesus Christ in the book of Acts is what we call like the transition period from how things worked in the Old Testament until how they're going to take place in the New Testament. And Pentecost is the place where a lot of that change starts to take place among people. And so it is a sign, it is a witness to the Jews that God is about ready to work and God's going to do something a little bit different than he has done in the past. And so he's using the same symbol as he has in the Old Testament when he brought the fire and he brought the cloud, the pillar of clouds and he brought the wind. He has this rushing wind and this fire that comes up on people to symbolize a tie back that he's still the God of the Old Testament, but he is going to do something now different here in the New Testament or what we call the church age. So let's see some other places in the Old Testament where, where the Holy Spirit came upon somebody. Judges 6, 1 through 16 and verse 34. 1 through 16? Um, chapter 6, 11 through 16 and verse 34. Sorry, I'm messing you up again. 11 through 16? Yeah, I'm just messing you up. I'm having fun. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all of this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which... Our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord...
Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel, Israel from the hand of the Midianites have I not sent you. So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my plan is the weakest. And I don't know. You have to spell it. I, I, my mind's not picking up exactly what the next word is in that verse. M A N A S S E H. Manifest. What is it? Manasseh. 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 Yeah. And I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Now 34. Yeah, yeah. In verse 34 is going to pick up on one of the things we'll hear here. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, then he blew the trumpet, and the Uh, you got me. What it was spelled out? Yeah, it's a uh, advisor rights or something okay. like that. Advisor rights. Advisor rights <laughs> gathered behind. Him. Okay. Um, and so what we have there are the main things that come upon, and it's in verse thirty-four. And so a lot of the Old Testament saints that God would come upon them to enable them to do a task, to do a mission, to accomplish something, and when that was done, then the Spirit of God kind of left them. One of the advantages we have, as we'll see here more, is that we, uh, in the New Testament, when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in our heart and never leaves us. Stays with us our entire life. And so we have something the Old Testament saints did not have. And we've got to realize that when we're looking at Old Testament saints, that they're falling and so forth. We fall in the New Testament. We have the Holy Spirit with us all the time. And they didn't. And they still fell. But we also fall in the New Testament, even though the Holy Spirit is with us. Any questions or comments when we look at some more Old Testament verse? We'll look at David here in a second. He's one of the few Old Testament people, and most likely probably the only one, that it seems like the Holy Spirit came upon him, and the Holy Spirit really never left him, as far as we can tell. And so he's a picture of the New Testament, a little bit of what's going to happen. He still didn't have the indwelling, but the, he's the closest example we have in the Old Testament, what we experience now in the church age. Go ahead and read uh, 1 Samuel 16, 1-13 there, Cindy. Yeah, you got it. I got confidence in you. Uh, now the Lord said to Samuel, follow along. Wait, 16, 1 through 13. Yeah, First Samuel chapter 16, 1 through 13. As uh, He's going to go by and he's going to select it, and he's going to end up picking. If you want to go and skip some of that, because the first part of it is just talking. Get down about, about uh, verse, uh, I think verse 10 would probably be a good place to start if I can remember correctly. Yes, right? yep, yep, Jesse. Mm -hmm. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking, and the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of all of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to <coughs> So it came upon David, like it did. Um, getting in. If you read verse 14 while you're there too there, Cindy. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressed spirit from the Lord troubled him. So at one time King Saul had the spirit of God upon him. But Saul did some things that God wasn't happy with. And so now the spirit of God, it says, is resting upon David. And it seems like he stays with David until David dies, even though David commits some very heinous sins. But it seems like the God Spirit is still there working in David's life. Um, but he's not the indwelling like we have in the New Testament. So 1 Chronicles 12, 18. Then the, then the Spirit came upon Amasai. Amasai, chief of the captains, and he said, Oh, I done forgot where I was reading. Now. You 
You're on First Chronicles 12, 18. Well, it came upon Amishai, chief of the captains, and he said, We are yours, O David, we are on your side. A son, o son of Jesse, peace, peace to you, and peace to your helpers, for your God helps you. So David received them and made them captains of the troops. Okay, so again, they come upon. Um, then Ezekiel 2.2. 2. Then the Spirit entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet, and I heard him who spoke to me. So you have the Spirit entering, but it doesn't say it stayed. And it's, again, it's an empowering. Um, again, it's pointing us, though, to what this New Testament change is going to happen, that the Holy Spirit is going to come in and dwell. It's not going to enter. It's not going to rest upon us. It's going to indwell. It means it's going to stay and it's going to live. And so um, Joel 2, 28 to 29. Um, and Amos. I found Joel. Okay. What verses? Uh, verses uh, chapter 2, 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall pro prophesy. Mm -hmm. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants mm -hmm. and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So this is a prophecy by Joel of how the Holy Spirit eventually is going to come up on people and the different events that are going to take place when that happens. And we're going to see that in Acts 2, 16-18. 2, 16-18. Mm -hmm. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh, your son and your daughter shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and all my men servants and all my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. So this is the great New Testament miracle that happens the moment we get saved. And the first event that happens here at Pentecost, as the word of God is preached, and people believe and trust in Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. The Holy Spirit comes upon a group of lar a large group of people all at once, and and, and so they, they fulfill the prophecies of Joel. And the difference again is it's not upon, it's not entering, it is indwelling, because the Holy Spirit comes and indwells. And that word indwell means to live, to reside, to stay in our hearts when we trust in Christ. First Corinthians three sixteen. Do you not know what you are, the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Okay, think about this. We would say this is like the house of God, even though it's just a building. The house of God truly is the people. But we would say this is the house of God. How many of us would think we would come in here and do something very heinous sin inside the church building? Probably not. I mean, there's more people will to do so today. But many of you of your generation, older generation, they wouldn't even care. They wouldn't even think about even lying inside of a church building, uh, much less doing something heinous. But we as Christians need to realize that our bodies is the temple of God. And it, whether we're in this physical building we call a church doesn't really matter because God doesn't live in this physical building, the church. He lives where? In the hearts of believers, the church, which is the body of Christ. And so when we're allowing ourselves to be involved in sin... The temple of God is in us, and we're taking God into that sin when we're sinning. So, um, so what's the significance of God dwelling in the temple in our heart? That's his house. That's his place of residence. That's where he lives at. And we've got to remember that he dwells, he lives in our house, in our hearts. That's where his house is. 1 Corinthians 3.1 then, Cindy. And I uh, read, read, read. By every breath. Brethren. Cause of brethren. Okay, brethren, sorry. Could not speak to you as to a spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. So what he's using here, the book of Corinthians is not the, the church at Corinth, when Paul is writing, not the church that we want to say that we want to follow their example. Paul gives examples after examples after examples how they're not really living for God. But he still calls them brethren. 
He still says they are saved. But he says there are many of them that are saved. They're just, they're, that's all that's happened. They've got saved. They're still living like the world. They're still carnal. And, but the difference between a lost person and a carnal Christian, really the only difference is, is that the carnal Christian has at least trusted in Christ and they're going to heaven. And sometimes you can't tell the difference between a carnal Christian and a lost person. Sometimes lost people live better than we do as Christians. And there's other times we as Christians, we live a whole lot worse than lost people do. And so he's referring and saying that you guys are times that you live very carnal, but you're still of the faith because you know Christ as your Savior. That's what matters. That's what changes our destiny. And so this indwelling of the Spirit is an experience that takes place that, it, that is permanent, and it happens at the moment we get saved. And so um, some people will try to teach that, that we lose our salvation. Some people will teach that the Holy Spirit leaves us. But Scripture clearly teaches that once the Holy Spirit comes upon us as believers of the New Testament, Old Testament was different. But in the New Testament, at the, after the event of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes in our heart and he stays there with us until we die. And what happens after death, I don't know. Because we go to heaven. So I don't I, I, And he's going to be there. He's here, there. So I, some, someone, I don't know, somebody asked me well, if the Holy Spirit's with us after we die. And, and I, I really don't know the scripture doesn't say, but, it's, but, but the Holy Spirit is with us until the moment we die, at least. That scripture clearly teaches that part. Right. Um, and when we go into the presence of heaven, we're going to be with God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit's also going to be there. So um, Ephesians 5.18. Yes. Okay, go ahead and read Romans 8 9 then, sorry. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you now. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So if someone doesn't have the Holy Spirit in the heart, they're not saved. That's what God's Word says. Now, um, Ephesians 5 18. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is this with excess. Drunken with wine, dissipation. whereas in ex what's that? Dissipation. Is that that word? Oh, yeah. yeah, it's a different word, but um, you don't know. Sorry, this sir. Word, this word. D i s s i patient. Okay. Okay. Dissipation. Dissipation. Dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. Uh, and, and so we're told not to be drunk with wine, and, and, and the verse I have in my head is in excess, which is dissipation. Um, but the same principle that takes place there is when someone is drunk with alcohol, how do they behave? Stupid. Mm. They, 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 they're being controlled by the alcohol, right? They're not making right decisions. Yep. They're, not, they're not thinking straight. They're not walking right. Well, it's not quite the same, but similar as Paul's used this illustration. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit... And the Holy Spirit is leading us. He helps control us so we avoid sin and helps us control our tongue sometimes so we don't say those sinful things that should come out of our mouth. He, he grabs and kind of like clamps down and says, no, you shouldn't say that. Or you shouldn't do something like that. So the Holy Spirit, in a roundabout way, he influences, he controls us to try to help us to avoid sin once we have trust in Christ and have the Holy Spirit in our heart. So think about this. What are some things that the Holy Spirit... Um, that as the Holy Spirit's in you, that how it would cause you or help change the way you behave. What would be some things, maybe since you've been saved, the Holy Spirit works in your life that you behave differently because of it? The Holy Spirit uh, lets you know that if you are tempted to do something, the Holy Spirit lets you know, no, you don't want to do that. Because your body's God's temple, and and you need to, you know, uh, you need to listen to what also what God's word tells too as well. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit, if you think about it, anybody else have something that they can think of that themselves where they know the Holy Spirit has helped them from doing something sinful or has know, directed them? A lot of times, people call it the law of response. Okay, when you think about it, just let me know and I'll stop again. Um, and so the, the, this Holy Spirit is not what some people teach where the Holy Spirit slays you in the ground and you're bouncing around. No, the Holy Spirit directs us and guides us, influences us. Like you're going down the road and all of a sudden someone cuts you off. You could real easily right there, especially if you have a bunch of kids in the car, you could just let it go. 
You think about some of the worst words you might say in a situation like that, and the Holy Spirit automatically reminds you, oh, you got a kid there right sitting beside like you. One, like when all your friends are smoking and using bad language. Yeah, like when all your kid, friends are smoking and using bad language, and, and the Holy Spirit says, you better not participate. You need to get away from here. You need to leave. And so the Holy Spirit works in our lives to help protect us from falling into sin and guiding us to make the right decisions. Um, so being filled with the Holy Spirit, then, is different than other ministries of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit here is being the feeling of it is guiding, directing us. We're obeying and listening. And everyone who has trusted in Christ, though, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit comes upon them the moment they trust in Jesus Christ. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is completely separate than water baptism. We don't want to confuse the two. We've learned about a little bit water baptism. Water baptism is a testimony that you're saved. The Holy Spirit comes as a spiritual baptism at the moment we trust in Christ, and we need to keep them separated. Um, then, I, So how many Christians, though, are filled with the Spirit? If we're all indwelled by the Spirit, how many of us are actually filled with the Spirit? We all. All those that we All that, the ones who are filled are all those who are obeying. Because you can lose the filling of the Spirit. But you can't lose the indwelling of the Spirit. It means that you're doing what God wants, you're obeying God, you're following God's rules. There's a difference there. When we're filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is basically guiding us, we're listening to it, we're obeying it, we're doing what God wants to do. The indwelling of the Spirit is different. The indwelling of the Spirit is the, that seal, of that redemption, that guarantee that's on our heart when we trust in Christ. The down payment, the earnest that we're going to be taken to heaven. But the filling of the Spirit is done moment by moment as we obey and we listen and do what God wants us to do. So you know what? I can be filled with the Spirit right now, and then I can have a simple thought, and guess what? I'm not filled with the Spirit. But I can confess that sin and ask God to forgive me that sin, like in 1 John 1, 9, and guess what happens? I'm filled with the Spirit again. But then I have another evil thought I shouldn't have. I'm not filled with the Spirit. So we can be filled with the Spirit multiple times throughout our day. It'd be nice if we just would be filled in the morning and stay that way the whole day. But most of the time it doesn't happen because we have sinful thoughts, we have sinful actions. And so the filling of the Spirit is based upon contingence of our obeying and doing the will of God. But the indwelling of the Spirit is a permanent event that takes place the moment we trust in Christ. Okay. So I didn't confuse you. So those are the big differences there. We'll touch just a hair on here, and then uh, we'll pick up there next week and dealing with this, this losing of the filling of the Spirit, but gaining it back again is that, that, that passage in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we're going to touch on that a little bit next time, dealing with how we need to be walking with the Lord. We need to be obeying the Lord. If we want the Holy Spirit to have power in our life, we want the Holy Spirit to direct our life, we want the filling of the Spirit moment by moment throughout our day, making our choices as we honor God. Uh, Go ahead. Most people will say they have a conscience. Mm -hmm. For a Christian, that's the giving of the Holy Spirit. Yep. There's a difference between having what the, we call a conscience of yeah. the lost person. They, like um, Vince said, the Holy Spirit becomes our conscience the moment we trust in Christ. And there's a yeah. difference in the conscience there. The conscience of the lost person is they're afraid of being caught. They're sometimes ashamed. They may face some guilt. But the Holy Spirit's job is of convicting us that we need to change the, what we're doing. There's a big difference there. We need to get on the right track. We need to get on the right track. Jesus. Yeah. So we'll touch on some more of that next time. Anything else, we'll close in prayer. Pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this time together. We pray, Father, you allow us to allow the Holy Spirit to not just only, Father, to guide us, Father, but allow us to, to follow you and obey you so we have the filling of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that we have the guiding of the Holy Spirit and, and the leading of the Holy Spirit in our days through, as we serve you, Father, and we honor you and we obey you. We pray, Father, for those who may be listening and they don't know Christ as their Savior and they're confused about this issue where we talk about this uh, new life that we have now once we trusted in Christ and how the Holy Spirit lives in our heart and the Holy Spirit becomes our conscience and guidance, Father, of what we should and shouldn't do. We just pray you help them, Father, to come to know Christ as their Savior so they too can have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and become part of the family of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.